Hi everybody, watching at home. I'm Phoenix and today I'd like to talk about God and my perspective of God. So I was raised as a Christian, you know, every time I swore habitually, I would be all like, forgive me Father for the thing I just said in Jesus name, Amen, every time, just in case, you know, I don't want to go to hell, I was thinking. So I said my prayers and I, I made all of my apologies for my sins and redeemed myself here and there for quite a while. Through my teenage years and through experimentation with various substances that opened my mind uh, in the woods, I just started to change my perspective of God and my perception of it. And I steered away from my, my family and my mom's uh, tradition and her perspective of Christianity and Jesus and the man in the clouds and the devil in hell. Uh, I started to develop my own sense of God and made, 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 found my own connection with God in my own unique way. And my take on it is this, because you know, at the end of the day, you, you've got to realize, understand, and respect that everybody has their own take on God. You know, just like many different facets of the same diamond, they all reflect the light differently. But perhaps it's still the same light. Perhaps we're still perceiving the same thing. We're just bouncing it off into a different form, depending on our own personal angle and spin on things. So my take on it is as follows. Um, I've done a lot of reading over different ideologies, and I've touched on different religions from the Kabbalah to uh, the Indians' take to Christians' take to the agnostics take and theosophy and all of this and really what I've come to understand isn't even really from what I've read and everything that I've looked at like I said I kind of arrived at my own conclusion through meditation and through really going inside I mean everyone tries to understand the ineffable you know, that which is beyond words God you know, that which is eternal and absolute, omnipotent, omniscient, all of that. And they try to do it by finding references, finite and specific, particular references on Earth. And really, I think, instead of trying to look outside and finding all the clues, I mean, there are clues, but no, none of them will describe or encapsulate the essence of God in its entirety. To do that, to really have a connection, a pure connection, or the next best thing to a pure connection with God, you have to go inside. And that in that inner landscape, there's a lot more space and a lot more time that you can explore and learn to understand in a more intimate way. So my my take on it is on this, enough beating around the bush. You know, there's a, a term called the new sphere. That's no osphere, newosphere in science, which is in as the scientific way of describing the hive mind. And a bit of the hive mind idea comes into my conception of God. There's this thing called the hundredth monkey effect. There's an island, right? And on this island, every time a monkey wants to eat, they take veggies and whatever. They dig it out of the ground and they just start eating it with all the sand on it and whatever. They don't give a shit. They just they eat nothing but mammals. Until some baby monkeys one day start cleaning the fruit and vegetables before eating it. As soon as 100 monkeys start doing this on a separate island, totally you know unrelated, without any contact whatsoever between the two islands, another bunch of monkeys started automatically, habitually, instinctively washing their vegetables and fruit before eating it. And the idea is that all of the information that we develop here on this plane, everything that surfaces, all of our understandings and our knowledge and new forms of awareness, it also goes into a, another place or a non-place where everything is connected and where everything can tune into and where everything receives the same information in, in the form of instincts, intuition, you know, uh, 
inspiration. You know, all of the eyes, all of the eyes. And really, to me, when I, when I think about the term intuition, I look at it as being the tutor within. The tutor within, the teacher within. And just like Neil Donald Walsh in Conversations with God, the whole book, which is a series of books, which is based on a man asking himself questions and then writing from that place within, from the tutor within, from God. And he shares the same take that I do, that God resides in all of us, in every single living creature, from the minute bacteria and flea to, to me and you, and even more complex forms. And beyond that, my belief also continues at, at that God is also within everything, and everything is of God, including rocks and, you know, this, this piece of wood chip right here. It's a very sacred chip. You know, everything is of God. It's all a mirror image and a very particular image of that which is in particular and, and vague, you know, the essential face of God. And that's how I see this world. I see this world as like a mirror and it's a way for God to perceive itself and identify itself. You know, it looks into the mirror and it sees a face in the image. And that's what life is. It's nothing but an image, a reflection of the infinite, a reflection of all potential. And I believe just like the monkeys all being interconnected and all having this access to the same pool of information to the hive mind, to the new sphere, that uh, everything, that God, this, this overall mind, you know, in a way, it's everybody is tuned into the same mind. Everybody has access and in a way is being puppeted by the same grand puppet master or masters. Maybe it's a collective, you know, maybe there's a ranking system from the source of all life and vibration and consciousness going down through various agents and various hierarchies of agents or archangels, angels, various deities. Maybe there is truth in all these different cultures, perception of God and perception of entities and deities. Maybe that they, they all exist, but they work to collectively and they all represent a different aspect of, of life. Um, that would also fit in with the Kabbalistic tree of life and that one's take on on everything in existence, creation of life, and all the governing agencies for different domains of existence. So that's my take on it. To me, you know, I believe in a, in a master puzzler, you know? And every single person, every single living thing, every single inanimate object, because to me it's all living. Everything is made of atoms. Atoms are alive. It's all vibration, it's all energy, it all follows set rules and has various levels of consciousness. And so some levels of consciousness are more complicated and some are very simple. Just like the consciousness of action reaction. Like I, I drop this chip and once again, just like before, it falls. Chances are it will adhere to the rules of gravity every time. So you've got cause and effect, action, reaction. You know, and then it moves up towards where we're at. Where it's, it's more about our consciousness and our choice of choosing how to react. It's not just like something happens, you know. I mean, maybe, it, maybe there isn't choice. Maybe we have the perception of choice, but then maybe that's an illusion. Maybe there's an inner equation, life's a mathematical formula, and everything is following a causative chain, and we're just beyond, beyond awareness of it. And maybe we exist in like a existential lag, always a step behind watching ourselves, behaving the way we do, acting the way we do, saying the things we're saying without actually having any control or rhyme or reason or choice in it. And after the fact, post facto, we come up with the excuses and the reasons and the meanings and the justifications as to why we're doing the things we're doing and why we're saying the things we're saying as to fool ourselves into believing we have control and volition. But maybe it's all just happening. And we create the ideas afterwards of why it's happening. Who knows? There are some scientific experiments that they actually point to that conclusion. They got a whole bunch of people in a room and there was a button, they got them all to push the button as quickly as they heard a sound, like a beep. 
And when they actually recorded this, it turns out that everybody pushed the button a split moment before they actually registered the sound. And I'm not sure how they determined that the people registered the sound, where they had things hooked up like nodes and re measuring brave way, brain waves and whatever. But uh, apparently that was the case, that people actually reacted in time with the beat before they even consciously were aware of it and registered. It's, it's like they were on autopilot, pretty much. And it was pure reactionary, no control, pure determinism, no choice. And that's really the debate. Is it, is it, is life deterministic, you know? Or do we have control and free will? I like to believe it's a bit of both. I believe that everything is like a game on a disc. Now, when you look at a computer game, all the potential pathways and every single possibility and every combination, all the elements within the game that can be combined to form new possibilities, they're already present on that disc. And depending on how the player plays the game is actually how the game unfolds and the unique experience of the game for each unique player. So, in a way, it's deterministic because there's only so many possibilities, there's only so many elements that we can play with and combine. There are only so many new forms to make and so many uh, primary colors to start with and shades uh, potentially thus. And at the same time, we choose how to take each opportunity, which elements to interact with and use in this game. So that's how I kind of view life. And if you, if you view the game as being God, if you view the disc as being God, and you know, keeping in mind that the idea of God is outside of time, outside of space. You know, it's not finite, it's omni, omniscient, omnipotent. Um, it's all pervading, always, eternally. So if you look at God as being the disc, one could even maybe see that every single possibility behind us and every single possibility in front of us is already present. It's already there, mapped out like a massive blueprint. And depending on how all the different players everywhere play their game, they, all these different possibilities are activated thus within this eternal disc, this absolute disc, which is never ending in its possibilities, never ending in its elements, but it's still all there. It's all set in an essentially, an essential blueprint kind of way, like a guest job, you know, blueprint of energy, but it's not actually manifested yet. And then if you take into account the possibility of parallel universes and multiverses you know and looking in there in the in the aspect that you know if you're in a room with two doors at that very moment there are two possibilities three possibilities present you either stay in that room you will a moment later be in the other room or be in the second room there's only so many possibilities and there's nothing else in the room to interact with you know and let's say you don't have a mouth, you don't have a brain to think or anything. All you are is just a bunch of legs with a basic system to help control the legs and make it work one way or the other and find a doorway, you know? Then there's only so much that can happen from that point. Two doorways, there's ultimately three possibilities. You stay where you are or you go into either doorway, into either room. And then let's say each room has two more entry points, you know? So from that point, now you're open to six possibilities or five you can either go back to the room you're in or you can go into another room so that's three possibilities actually and on it goes each room has more doors every time you're in a space based on all the potential pathways around you the idea with parallel universes is that you are actually walking through every single door every single potential pathway possibly is unfolding side by side parallel to each other infinitely keeping in space that god and the disc and the game of life isn't like a computer game it's not finite and limited it would make sense that if this whole entire existence was being created by the ultimate creator so that the creator could understand itself as the created then why if god was eternal and absolute would he just or she or it want to limit itself in its expression, limit itself in its exploration and development of self 
if it has the capacity to explore itself infinitely. Why wouldn't it take every single pathway? If I take one step here, it's like I see all these different pathways lining up under my feet, and maybe there are, there are millions of versions of myself walking off with every single step and every single interaction and change in where I'm at time and space-wise. Maybe I am actually creating a new chain, a new causal chain like dominoes going off everywhere like a fractal all at once. Maybe I am stepping off in every single different direction, doing every single possible thing I could be doing at the same time. With each step, it's literally an infinite fractal of possibilities, and maybe I exist infinitely. And when I say I, I don't mean the I above, I don't mean the master puzzler moving all the pieces around on the board and creating all these, these temporal images and temporal formations and times and events but I'm talking about all the different puzzles, infinite puzzles being created at any point and the overall consciousness being able to create every single image possible. So in, in this place where we have a lot of greed and exploitation and murder and theft and transgression of all kinds pervading across the globe by the rich elite and minority who have the whole entire majority of the Earth's populace under its giant greedy fat green thumb, Maybe there's also another parallel reality where it's similar. We have all this technology and everything's great, but at the same time, we've decided to actually value what matters most, value the earth we live on, the environment which nurtures and sustains us. And we've been able to develop ourselves technologically, mentally, in every way possible, whilst being in harmony and working in accord with nature. You know, maybe there is a paradise out there you know, everything we've got now, but better. You know, the realities we dream about when we think about revolutions and social reforms and the overthrowing of government and the formation of a new future. Maybe these new futures are already current, present existences that we are experiencing on another plane parallel to this one. So maybe in that theory, in that fantasy, if some might call it, we can find solace. And also, with that theory and that fantasy, some might call it, we can find relief and peace, and we can think that it doesn't matter what happens to us on this plane. It doesn't matter what pain you go through, your trials, things you lose, all of it. It's all a learning curve, it's all an expression of God, and you're helping God understand itself one life at a time, one step at a time an infinite amount of lives and steps at a time. And that where you are frowning now and crying now, you are smiling and dancing somewhere else simultaneously. It kind of makes it easy not to get totally caught up and lost in all the petty, superficial, trivial workings of now and this place and what's happening when really meaning, the essential meaning, the quintessential meaning of life extends beyond what's happening now. What's happening in general. It's not about what's happening. It's about where it's coming from and where it's going. What's happening is but a transition, like a moving vehicle from one place to another. And this place is God, and this place is the mirror. And we are the reflection and the projection at the same time. And that's my understanding of God. God, this process I'm talking about, this, you know, this shadowy existence, this smoky realm that we exist in, which is one combination of yin and one combination of yang. You know, the eternal, infinite, feminine potential, and the finite, finite, uh, finite, uh, manifested, masculine, you know, mirror world that the essential sees its face in. The place that we are in as a combination of the two is is like a shady, shady place, a smoky place. There are no black and whites here. There are no extremes or absolutes. Everything is relative because it is one part ultimate truth and one part finite beauty, which when you combine, you get relative truth and absolute beauty. 
and that's what I believe exists. I don't believe in absolute truth. It's not conceivable here because we are of God. It is impossible for any piece on the puzzle board or any pigment in the painting to step outside of itself and see them. No matter how holy they may have seemed to be or how holy they are portrayed as being, it is impossible for any one singular person to perceive the ultimate picture and to perceive God in its entirety. We can connect with God entirely and absolutely sure. But even once we return to our bodies and all that information experience of that connection is translated through our brains, it's, it's packaged using finite means and using the unique signs known to our existence based on what we've seen, based on what we've become aware of, gained as knowledge. You know, just like dreams, you go, you dream, you go into an infinite place, you experience a lot of stuff, and you get that feeling when you wake up. It's like, whoa, that was like a whole nother existence, a whole nother world. It was way too complex, and all these variables and relationships for it to just be nothing, a spurious part of the brain. So who knows, like maybe we experience an infinite amount of information when we're sleeping, but when we wake up, it gets packaged using all those symbols that we're aware of, the language we're aware of, and we put it into a linear, finite strip so that it makes sense. So what really what the dream as we remember it is might not have actually been how it was in the experience essentially. But it's just the way that we painted it so that we can recognize it and conceive it. And it's the same with God. God's too big for any part of God to stare outside of itself, you know? Just like this pinky has no understanding of everything else that's going on in my body, but it's still all interrelated. It's just part of a bigger package, a bigger picture. It all works together, you know, all your organs, all your involuntary organs, you don't need to think about anything. You need to work on make sure your lungs are breathing and your heart's beating, you know, and everything's doing its job. It just does it automatically. It works together in harmony. And that's another indicator of everything being interconnected. And I do believe that not everything it's not just about the body working together, but I believe everything, even outside of ourselves, collectively works in tandem with each other and that everybody is affected, just like the butterfly effect implies, by every single action and thought across the globe. We all feel along the same lines and think along the same lines. And this explains synchronicity. This explains why people will be talking about the same things around the same times. You'll hear about the same ideas being mentioned or the same events, you know. And or somebody will say something just as you're thinking and you'll think, wow, what good timing. Or you'll think about someone consistently and then you'll see them later on that day or the next day. All these coincidences, really they're just, maybe it's just a matter of all these pieces, like I said, being controlled by the same entity. And so they are all working along the same lines because they're being controlled by the same guy or gal or thing. And so of course they're gonna form patterns that are very uniform. And that universally we're all gonna be kind of drawn together into formations that we as pieces making these pictures don't understand. We don't see the greater picture and the reason why we're being pulled together and why we're being pulled apart, why some things are collapsing and some things are building up, but it's all working together. So that's that's my take on it. You know, the God is within, the tutor within, and beauty, I was saying that truth, you know, there's no black and white here, it's all yin and yang, it's all just smoke. And um, this is what David Bohm calls the, the implicate order and the explicate order. And David Bohm is a quantum physicist and a philosopher. And his idea of the high hive mind or the ground unconscious, Jung, is that, you know, you've got the implicate order, which is the hive mind. And then you've got the material world that we perceive. This is the explicate order. It's explicit. It's known, very obvious, as opposed to the implicit, the implicate. And what he describes as an enfolding and an unfolding. Basically, all information that is developed and unfolds into the explicate order at the same time enfolds back into the implicate order and can be accessed by anyone else uh, in existence. So let's say you know a person has a number three on their head, another person has a number two. Well, let's just say that there is a number three as, a, as an entity, and there's a number two as an entity. And these two entities collide, they meet each other in the material plane. 
automatically, as soon as they collide and meet each other, and that junction is known, there is a three, there is a two, they become a five. And when that new information is developed based on that new combination of elements and forms and ideas, when that new element is created, the five, the five is enfolded back into the source as well as that it becomes known on the, on the explicate world. And then anyone else in the world can then take that five on, upon themselves and express it. So when new ideas are developed, um, they can also be accessed across the globe from other people. This is where you have inventors known in the past, back before the internet, back before mass communication, international communication was very easy, efficient, or po even possible that people would be coming up with similar ideas, similar lifestyles, similar inventions at the same time. It's like they were working from the same base or same scrapbook forming these, these various signs, these various ideas. And that's how it is. That, you know, the really, we don't exist in the implicate and the explicate order, the explicate is what we see, you know, it's, it's, it's the signs. And when I say sign, I mean you know, that which can be seen. And then the, the more essential component to the sign is the significance. You know, God is significance. The world is just a sign. And we denote and attribute significance to the sign based on how we, as God, express ourselves using the signs. You know what I'm saying? The, the significance of a sign changes over time. The meaning of the means changes over time. And in this place, the only thing that is constant is change. And that's why we're in neither a fixed place, the explicate, or an unfixed place, the implicate, the yin and the yang. But we're in the middle, the unfolding and the enfolding, the projecting, projecting and the reflecting back, the becoming aware, whilst also taking in information and uh, being impressed. So, you know, I believe it's, it's, it's impossible to conceive absolute truth. I was touching on that before. It's all relative. And one man's truth is another man's lie. And it's, it's relative to the user and the perceiver. Just like the beauty of the apple, you know, it's relative to the beholder. Um, beauty, I say, is absolute. Because absolute yin and relative yang collide. And when I say beauty is absolute, I mean that, you know, he's got full potency that will last forever and it cannot die. Unlike truth, truth can be divided and it's never absolute. It's never absolutely potent or true. It's always relative, like I said before. Beauty, for an, on the other hand, if you, if you take a painting and you put a painting on a wall, you know, that same painting like Leonardo da Vinci, millions and millions of eyes can stare into and they can determine new meanings from it and they can give it more power give it more appreciation and meaning over time the amount of beauty that can be received from the painting over time is potentially infinite potentially absolute given that the painting itself doesn't perish or get lost to the winds of time winds of change so beauty is what i look for in life my driving motivator. The quest for truth is useful, but truth is relative, and I can use it so that I can achieve relative success. Because it doesn't matter whatever your idea of success or, you know, conquering your dream, it's always relative. What might be your dream one moment might end up being something which leaves you very unfulfilled, unsatisfied later on, and you realize it wasn't actually a dream, you know? So success is also relative. The idea of success and attainment of happiness is temporal. It is open to the same constant of change as everything. The only thing which is absolute is beauty. And beauty is simply the recognition of God within the sign of God, within the mirror of the eternal face. In all its forms, whether it be the rain or the trees or the fog, or people crying, people laughing, violence, love, all of it. There is beauty in everything. I think being able to recognize where it all comes from and being able to appreciate where it's all going, that's the idea of beauty. That's the idea of art. And really the quest for truth 
is simply it's there just to help the master or the magician better hone his skills and use the elements to at to his advantage based on his own game plan and that's it we're all magicians here we all have our own plan how we want to play this life is open to the individual you know there's no right there's no wrong way it doesn't matter what your doctrine says it doesn't matter what their doctrine says everyone's got their own take and that's where i think it becomes essential to recognize that you know we all owe each other respect because even though we're seemingly separate like fingers on the same hand we're all interconnected just because you can't see it trust you can feel it and if we can bring the fingers together we can hold a lot more and we can do a lot more and that's my that's my take on god for those uh, interested out there so uh, feel free to post your own takes and how you relate to this you know and really seriously like as much as drags drugs have a bad rep i did experiment a few years in the past with some psychedelics and then after having dmt for the first time and this is the general testimony of how dmt affects you dmt is produced in the brain you know the pineal gland which is between the two hemispheres the left brain logic and the right brain creative and abstract it releases dimethyltryptamine at three points when you're asleep when you're uh, dreaming when you're born and when you die when you die your pr pineal gland releases an explosion of dimethyltryptamine dmt so when you actually smoke the stuff which is the acacia bark of the acacia tree if you smoke it it causes your di your pineal gland to release dimethyltryptamine the same substance that you have released when you're dreaming while you're awake so you actually get to experience your dream time whilst conscious and everybody feels the same thing and shares the same recognition which is basically that everything is interconnected you know you can see that rock that tree and those people beyond it and though you, you perceive with your eyes everything as being separate inside when you're on this and you're in this dream place where everything is unified you really get that sense of interconnectivity that there is no separation and that's all illusion separation is an illusion and you feel unified with everything and then there's the fractals and there's the hallucinating and everybody enjoys that part especially and it's quite something as well you know you actually see the mathematical and the what's that term shapes and shit i forget the term but the mathematical formula of existence and you kind of perceive the code of existence while awake it's quite it's quite something for your brain to comprehend that's why i think it just starts tripping balls but uh it's very unique how everyone hallucinates the things they see it has been known with dmt that you can actually use it to communicate with different entities on different levels and different planes um and you can even find your higher self you know your higher entity um that's guiding you in your life so you experiencing that myself and then with lsd similar things i've sensed just within and it, that's what i mean at some point there is a level of faith in this because he's he can't describe the ineffable which is the undescribable and he can't measure the infinite which is beyond all measure using scientific means scientific terms you can't use a ruler to measure something that goes on and on and on and on so some things it's just based on in a way feeling and then in a knowing and i know that's open to interpretation it's open to bias and delusion and often it does people get delusional but i guess that's where faith does come into it and sometimes you just know some things to be true because truth is inside and i think the difference in determining those that know the truth and those that have just been conditioned with indoctrination and propaganda and they're just espousing what they've been told and what they've read in books is that he who closes his eyes this is along the lines of a jesus quote, quote he who closes his eyes finds the light in himself brighter than any light outside it's blinding he who closes his eyes and listens 
they're in the most silent of places to that inner voice, which you can only hear once you block out the distracting noise and white noise of the outside world. He who finds the truth inside has a deeper understanding of God than those who receive the idea of truth from the outside and then try to sell it to other people. Really, I think God is infinite. There is no particular face God has except what you assign. And everybody's unique face that they assign, everyone's sign that they assign to significance, and the, the means, the means that everyone uses to connect with meaning works for everyone. And it's just as just, it's just as sound, and it's just as true relative to the God beholding God, or the creation beholding the Creator. So yeah, life's a game, people. You're a player, and maybe one day when you master this game, when you keep coming back as your different profiles, as your different characters, hopefully your user profile, your main entity, your higher self, will fulfill its attributes, fulfill its objectives, and balance itself. And hey, maybe one day you can join Team God and actually start designing all these realms and all these existences and writing out all the potential life plots and scripts and blueprints for all of these players to be playing, yo. But it's all a game. It's all a ride and enjoy it. You know, as Bill Hicks says, don't get distracted by all the lights and don't take it all too seriously for it is just a ride. It's temporal. And it all comes from the same place. We're all going to the same place and that's why we should all just embrace each other embrace and love each other and realize that despite the different ways that we relate to God, despite the different ways that we identify life and what it means, we all come from the same place. We all smile when we're happy. We all cry and frown when we're sad. We all want peace. We all want nurturing. We all want love. We all want friendship and to be together. And we all just want to live in harmony. Even if we want to do it differently, as long as we essentially recognize those principal elements that unify us, I think it'll be a lot easier to get over, finally, all the superficial aspects that divide us. United we stand, divided we fall. United we already are. We just got to realize it. Realize, realize, real eyes. Or I should say, realize, realize, real eyes. Thanks, man. Hope you enjoyed watching yourself. God, oh, homie Jesus. Yo, man.